Thank you so much for visiting LifePoint Church online. If God is doing something special in your life, we would love to hear about it. You can share it with us on our stories page at www.visitlifepoint.org forward slash stories. One of the reasons we're able to provide weekly broadcasts just like this is because of the generosity of people just like you. If you'd like to support this weekly broadcast, you can do so by leaving a donation right here on the website. Maybe you can give $100. Maybe you can give $200. Maybe you can give $20. No matter what you give or how you give, know that your generosity is making a difference. If you'd like to be a part of what LifePoint Church is doing by giving financially, you can do so safely and securely by clicking on the Give button at the bottom of the page. Thank you so much for joining us at LifePoint Church Online. We look forward to hearing a powerful message from God's Word today. Good morning, church. So good to be here. You can have a seat. Thank you for that warm welcome. You know, it's, it's one thing. It's one thing to, to walk into to home and you feel like you're at home. I am not a, a, a fan. I'm not a friend, though I am those things. When I walk into here, I feel like I'm family. And so thank you to Pastor Daniel and Tammy, to the pastoring, the pastoring team and the teaching team and uh, for our Spotsy campus and for Stafford. We love you. We're so grateful that you're here. Um, now, if you are here and you came through the sleet and the snow, um, I pray that you are blessed from the top of your head to the tip of your feet. I pray that your marriage is blessed, that your husband doesn't smell and your wife doesn't nag you. I pray that if you have kids, your children are obedient and they look like models out of a catalog and they don't talk back, they will rise in the morning and call you blessed because you were the Proverbs 31 woman. If you um, have a car, I pray that it has gas and your bank account is always full. If you are single, I pray that you meet somebody whose pockets jingle, who has blue eyes and an eight pack of abs and loves Jesus with all his heart and his perfectly straight teeth. And if you did not come to church because you're sitting at home because you cold, you get nothing, nothing. Okay, we'll bless you at the end, but it is very exciting to be here. Uh, like Pastor Daniel said, I was here less than a year ago and um, one of the things that I usually don't tell people is that I'm a lifeguard, or in 2002, I was a lifeguard. Uh, the last time that I was here, um, I was able to save somebody's life. Hand to heaven. I, I, it literally happened in a parking lot not, uh, not far from our old campus, and um, it, was, it, was, it was a very fun experience in retrospect. I'm like, move over, David Hasselhoff. There's a new Hoff in town. Old Hoff, okay? Um, I, I, it's not something I want to do again, but uh, last night at dinner, you know, I was talking to my husband. I'm like, Pastor Daniel's giving away a table. I mean, this series has been amazing. Like, last year, I saved somebody's life. Like, I need to turn water into wine or, like, walk on water, you know, snow on the ice, uh, ski on the ice or something. Uh, and then I realized last night, and I was going to bed and preparing for today, that I do have something to give you, and that is a word from the Lord. And so as we go in and we, we reclaim what is ours, I pray that this morning you reclaim your leadership identity. And so um, today we have, uh, or actually today is the end of a four-week series. We have gone through reclaiming the table, reclaiming our time around with family and friends. We've spoken about reclaiming our bedroom. My husband's here, and that's right. Uh, I brought him with me. He's so cute. And... Um, and, and then we spoke about reclaiming our swag. We heard about the amazing story of Gideon. And now I want to talk about reclaiming our identity as a leader. Now, uh, throughout the Bible, there are amazing characters. But the character that I want to speak to today uh, is a character who is not only powerful, but prophetic. This character is not only strong, but sensitive. That this character um, not only responded to the call of Christ, but rose to the invitation, rose to the occasion to lead well. And so uh, throughout this series, we've heard great passages and characters, but there is one character that is just resonating, and I pray that this character resonates with you as well. Um, you know, I don't want to have favorites, because the Bible says that favorites are wrong, but I kind of do, and this character is one of my favorites. Uh, there are many great characters. Uh, Ruth was a pagan Moabitess who was barren. She couldn't have children, and yet God put her, his favor on her, and she ended up being in the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Gideon, we just heard about him last week, you know, wavered in indecision, kind of a chicken. God, give me a sign. God gives him a sign. Give me another sign. God gives him a sign. Give me another sign. God gives him a sign. And yet God did not grow weary with him asking for signs. Or what about 
about, you know, uh, Rahab. Ain't nobody want to talk about Rahab because she's that girl. You know, she's a prostitute. And, you know, and yet we see her making a way for the children of Israel. And she gets to be in one of the hero, heroes of our faith from Hebrews chapter 11. What about David? David was a straight up murderer. And yet God said that he had a heart for him. And he goes down in both secular and biblical history as one of the greatest kings of the early, early church world and early world. And so uh, what this tells me uh, that God in the Old and New Testament is not looking for pretty and polished and perfect people to do his will. He's looking for anybody who is willing and available to do his will. So whether you are old, whether you are young, whether you are black, whether you are white, whether you're married or single, whether you are fit or your thighs touch like mine, God wants to use you. There's no excuses. There's no excuses in the economy of God. And, and so as we go through this passage, the reason why I chose this, and I spoke to Pastor Daniel about this, like, hey, what do you think for this word for the church? And he agreed. So this is a word um, on, on reclaiming our leadership identity. I believe that there are people who are hungry for leaders to rise up. I believe that, uh, that God is looking for leaders. Second Chronicles 16, uh, uh, 16, 8 says that the eyes of the Lord wandered to and fro to find those whose hearts are loyal to him so that he can show himself strong. God is looking for that. And the UC Berkeley backs up this data because listen to this research that recently has come out. 87% of people want a leader. 20% of people say that they have been a leader but only 8% of people consider themselves to be a leader. So there's this breakdown between us wanting leadership and us thinking that we're leaders. I get to, I have to, I want to tell you that God is looking out to each and every one of us saying, rise to the occasion to lead. Now, if you're sitting here and you're saying, well, I'm not a leader, I'm just a mom, I'm just a student, I'm just a manager at a grocery market, I just sit in a cubicle, you know what you just are? You are just a child of God, and that's all that you need to be in the economy of God to be used. And so whether you lead one or 100, 1,000 or 1 million, lead well, because we are all called as Christians to lead people to Christ. Therefore, we are leaders. Amen? Great. So, uh, Judges chapter 4. Turn with me to Judges chapter 4. If you brought your Bible, I want you to lift it up nice and high and say, word. 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 Thank you. Oh, come on, church. You need to bring your... Ch I'm just glad that you're here. I'm not going to throw stones because some of y'all didn't bring your Bibles. The heathens in the house will put the scriptures on the screen. That's okay. Uh, next week, bring your Bible. Uh, all right. Turn with me to Judges chapter 4. And if you didn't, the scriptures are on the screen. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about a character who you may or may not have heard of. Again, she's my favorite. Her name is Deborah. And she, uh, as the name will indicate, is a woman. And we don't see uh, many of these uh, highlighted characters. And yet, we see here in the book of Judges that a woman is highlighted. And so let's go excavate through her story. I'm a word nerd, okay? So we're going to go through verse by verse, exegetically, systematically, whatever way that you want to. Because I believe that God could speak to us line by line. Amen? All right, verse 4. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to have their disputes decided there. Now, uh, something to note. If you're taking note, pull out your pen, pull out your notebook, uh, because there will be some points that I give you, but then also just some interesting historical things that we see here. Please take note, don't just read and gloss over this, that she was a prophetess, which is a female prophet, now a and a judge. Now, a prophet or a prophetess is somebody that hears divinely from the Lord and can be and speak out words of God. So she's a prophetess, but she's also a judge. Now, I think it's important that we stop and pause and take a look. I mean, this woman was a bad mama jamar. Okay? Like, she had authority. She had power. She had political insight. This woman, I mean, this woman was the big kahuna, the big enchilada, the main enchilada. I mean, she, she was not just the judge of one tribe. No, church. She was the judge of the 12 tribes. This is very, very rare. And so I think, you know, it's a tall order in 2015, but it is a very, very big order in 1050 B.C., See, cultural context, let's geek out for a second. During this time, women didn't have uh, intellectual capita. They didn't have property rights. They had no access to excess. They had no education. In many places, they were treated as second-class citizens and in many places, abused. So here we have a woman 
who is a prophetess and a judge. Now let's, again, put this into context. She had the political prowess of a Condoleezza Rice and a a Hillary Clinton. She had the polished prose of a Beth Moore. And And we also see a prophetic power of Joan of Arc. All in one. She was bad. I mean, she's a master blaster from Lancaster, okay? There's some, there's some context for you. This woman is amazing. The only other people that we see in the scope of Scripture, the Old and New Testament, who bore the title of prophet and judge were only Samuel and Moses and Deborah, okay? So she's bad. I mean, she's like the corporate 100 CEO. She has power lunches and takes power naps and has PowerPoint presentations, and she goes on power walks. This woman probably wears chaps and drives a Harley. I mean, she is leading people. This woman is amazing. Very interesting to note in those two scriptures. Come on, word nerds, you're going to have to hang tight with me. There is a mention of a husband. Did you all catch that, Labadoff? Very interesting in the sentence structure. Usually what we see is a man's name listed and then a woman's name listed as their wife. Here, the, 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 flip is, the script is flipped, okay? We have Deborah list, listed first and then his name. There's no other mention of Lapidoth in the Bible other than to attribute Deborah's marital status. Interesting. So it's not about Lapidoth, it's about Deborah. Another tidbit of interesting information, anytime that there is a woman that's here in the Bible, it's usually within the scope of her, uh, her motherhood status, whether she's a mother or not a mother, um, whether it's barren or she's fruitful. And yet we see no mention of children throughout this text, whether that's choice or circumstance. Very fascinating because there's certain things that I'm sure were spoken over her life that she couldn't or shouldn't or wouldn't do, but she did. And as we go through this text, I want us to take care, pay careful attention to the characters in this narrative to challenge our assumptions of who and what we can be. Because what you are born into doesn't determine what is in you. As it's been said that your history doesn't predetermine your destiny. And we're going to see that in the lives of the characters that we see here. Deborah had to overcome many things. Think about it. We gave the cultural context. We also gave the biblical context. Again, she was probably told multiple times, you couldn't or you can't, you won't, it won't ever happen, you're not educated, you're not a mother, you have no land, you have no education. And yet we see here that Deborah had to overcome things like many of us have had to overcome things in our life. We need to stop seeing the things that the way that they are and sting God, start seeing God for who he is. Things are not the way that they seem because God is on the move and he's looking to us. I'm looking for people to respond to the voice, to respond to the calling of God, to say, I have something bigger for you. Are you willing? In verse, uh, verses one through three in Judges chapter four, we don't have heaps of time to get into that, but uh, let me just synthesize it really quick. There's a judge and his name is Ehud and he was a good judge and the children of Israel loved him and they followed in the eyes, the ways of the Lord. But then Ehud passes away, he goes to be with Jesus and the children of Israel turn back to their sin, much like us, we walk away from the Lord, we turn back to our sin and the enemy rises up, much like us, the enemy rises up. Can I get an amen? So what we see here is Ehud is gone and Deborah is now stepping up as judge the children of Israel are wayward. They're, they're just running amok, doing whatever they want. And there is a man by the name of Sisera. And Sisera is a commander of uh, an army. And it is the largest army uh, in the known world during this time. This is what's going on in verse 3. Because he, Sisera, had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years underline, highlight, get a tattoo on your forearm of this next sentence. They cried to the Lord for help. Now we could read scripture. We sometimes read the Bible and it's, you know, it's it's lovely. Oh, 900 chariots. And I like reading the Bible. Um, I know some of you guys are not going to get this reference, so I will have to demonstrate it. But sometimes I want us to read the Bible like a soap opera. Um, or if you are from my neck of the woods, I grew up watching novellas with my grandmother. And the difference between a novella and a soap opera is something like a soap opera. But John, I love you. But a novella is, pero Juanito, te quiero mucho, no se va. Okay? So, so when we read the Bible, 
I want us to go there like it's a novella, okay? We can read 900 chariots, oh, pish, pish, what is, you know, not, 900 tanks and an army of 400,000 people. These are Middle Eastern men with hair on their chest and hair on their arms and hair on their knuckles, and they are going up against the children of Israel who have nothing. They have no spear. They have no weaponry. How do we know this? Because in 1 Samuel uh, 13, 16 through 19, we are told that the Philistines overtook the children of Israel, and they burned all their weaponry, they took all their iron, and they killed their blacksmith. The children of Israel not only were smaller in number, but they didn't have weaponry. And yet, we see God show up. I don't want to make this drama feel like it's, it's, it's far from us, because may, maybe you're sitting in here, and there is no Sisera, and there are no chariots, and there are no spears, but you feel like you are oppressed, oppressed, depressed by an enemy that you cannot see, you cannot name, or you cannot claim, but it is over you. And you feel like, I am so tired of being tired. I am sick of being sick. I hate my job. I hate my spouse. I hate my children. Whether, whatever your enemy is in your household, look at what the children of Israel did. And they cried to the Lord for help. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call unto me and I will answer you. And what we see here is God does. In verse 4, we know that uh, uh, Deborah is leading God's people. But it's important to note, she didn't armbar or stronghold her way to the top. She didn't have a political campaign, vote for me, Deborah, judges of Israel. Like, there was nothing. We're told in Judges 2, 18 that it is God who appoints the judges. It is God who anoints and appoints. You don't have to fight for that struggle. Will you rise to the occasion? That is the better question. So God is beckoning us to rise and stand, to be leaders here in this community, around the globe, in Russia, in Brazil, in New York, in Fredericksburg, in Spotsy, wherever you are, to rise to the call that God has on you. Check out verse 6. She, Deborah, sent for Barak, son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take up with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Don't you love God? God claims victory before it even happens. Who does that? Only our God. And Deborah gets to speak that out. And I get to speak out a word for many of you in here today. God had delivered you. God is going to deliver you. Do not give up. Do not give up. This is what we see here. And in the original language, the, again, word nerd, in the original language, it's more of a rhetorical question as she's talking to Barack. Ugh. Barack, hasn't God told you to go? H hasn't God given you the battle plan? This is what we see here. And I want to be careful that we don't demonize Barack. We don't castigate Barack or make him feel like less than or a weak pansy. How many times have God asked us to do things? And we waver. We waver like Gideon. We doubt like Moses. We're a hater like Paul or Saul. And we don't move. Now here... I want to let us know that we're in good company because as we heard last week, uh, Gideon was a man who asked for a sign. God gave him a sign. Asked for another sign. God gave him another sign. Asked for a sign again and God gave another sign. And he's like, well, I'm not too sure. Moses had a burning bush talk back to him. And he's like, I, 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 I have a stutter. I can't go. Send Aaron. Or, you know, what about Jeremiah who's like, I'm just so young. I can't do this. Have you ever felt like that? You are unqualified. You are incapable. You are un something that you can't go. And I want us to know that they were going up a very against a really a very real battle. I empathize with Barack. That ratio is four to one for men. History even suggests, not biblical history, but history suggests that this man probably had been a POW, had gone up against the Canaanites, had gone up against other armies, and knew this doesn't make sense. It's four to one. We have no weapons. I, I empathize with him. I think that it is important that there are men in here and women um, who know what God is calling them to do. They know that God is calling them to lead their families, to lead their businesses, to lead in their universities, to lead in church, but yet many cower and are afraid because they're not sure. 
it is so beautiful to see a working relationship between a man and a woman. And women, we have the ability to tear up or pull down. And here, Deborah is encouraging Barak. She is speaking the truth, but she's speaking grace and truth. She's speaking the truth in love. Look at verse 8. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go with you. But if you don't go with me, I won't. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. Now some theologians say that God used a woman because a man wasn't available. But, hold up. You're going to tell me that the God of the Old Testament, the God who parted the Red Sea, who freed the children out of hundreds of years of Egyptian slavery, who took them into the promised land, who provided for them, the same God of the New Testament, which sent Jesus to be a propitiation for our sin, to heal the blind and the lame and the sick and the dead back to life, is too weak to find a man to lead the children? I think not, okay? I don't think so. You know what we see through the scope of Scripture is that God is using Anybody from any gender, any color, any socio socioeconomic class, and people that know how to speak, to do the things that he calls us to do. This is what we see here. We don't need to be a certain gender to respond to the call of Christ. So there are four things that I see in this passage, if you're taking note. Leaders speak grace and truth. In these scriptures, we see the indecision of Barak, and we see the confidence uh, of, of Deborah. She reminds him, go to battle, Barak. God is with you. You will win. But because of his fear, he says, I'm not going to go unless you come with me. So then she says, okay. But she also speaks the truth and love that the victory that was supposed to be yours is not going to be yours. It's going to be the hands of a woman. So two things to note here. If we were to stop the story here, I, in my flesh, would think, well, obviously it's Deborah because she has all her junk together. She's perfect and, you know, wears pointy tip show, shoes in the snow, never falls. I mean, like, this, is, this woman's amazing. Side note, we'll get back to that in a second. And the second thing that I see here is that she didn't use this opportunity to berate him or castigate him. And for the women of the house, whether we are dealing with our brothers or our fathers or our coworkers or our bosses or our husbands or our sons, we need to be very careful to speak the truth in love because we have the ability to break a man's ego. Are you going to build up like Deborah or are you going to tear down? And so... I don't want to be derailed by Barack's indecision here, but Deborah was the kind of leader that inspired confidence to those that were around her. Deborah was the one that inspired people to fulfill their calling and destiny. And Barack needed uh, more than inspiring speech. He didn't need her to do, you know, the thumbs up. Napoleon Bonaparte says, a leader is a dealer of hope. And to some extent, Barack was borrowing hope from Deborah. I see that that's the kind of, of leader I want to be. That's the kind of wife I want to be to Matt. That's the kind of stepmom I want to be to Parker and Ryan. That's the kind of employee I want to be to Nick and Christine Kane. That's the kind of friend and daughter and sister that I want to be. I want to speak truth to people. I want to be bold. I want to inspire a God confidence in them. And I encourage us, whether male or female, to learn these leadership tips from Deborah. For taking note, point number two. Leaders believe in something bigger than themselves. It is one thing to say, God be with you. Good luck. Speak some Christianese. Blessings. But it's an entirely other thing to say, I so believe in you, and I so believe in the God calling inside of you that I will stand by your side in the middle of the battle until we see victory in Christ. That is the type of leaders that we need to be. And Deborah had that kind of faith in God, and Deborah was inspiring that in Barak. And in verses 10 through 13, we are told that, that Barak uh, rounds up his troops, and, and, and Sisera rounds up his 40,000 men and uh, his 900 chariots. And we pick it up back in verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the God, has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and the army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harashesh, Hagioim, and all Sisera's troops 
fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of, Haz- ha- king of Hazar, and the family of Heber, the Kenite. Just as God promised, God did. Just as God promised, he did. There are people sitting in here with promises in their hearts. Do not lose hope. Just as God promised, he did. And we need to be the type of people that when God says victory is is yours, we believe victory is ours. God is giving us words. God is giving us promises. God is, I believe, giving us visions of what he's called us to be. And he will not fail us. He will not fail us, whether here or in heaven, whether now, if there is a beat in your chest, there is still hope for redemption and for turnaround, for leadership, to reclaim the identity that God God is speaking over you. And see, it's important to note that there are things holding us down. There are things that are making us slaves to, and the, the crux of the Bible is freedom. We are free in Christ to live how Christ has called us to live. But there is an enemy. There is an oppressor. The greatest enemy we have is Satan. And he, we are told that he is the father of what, church? Now, for our Spotsy campus and for our Stafford campus and for those that are online, they all said it here. I need to make sure you're saying it too. Satan is known as the father of what? Lies. He's known as the father of lies. So he is going to be speaking things over us. Barack, you pansy. You can't go to war. Are you kidding me? Deborah, you're a feminazi. People are going to take you serious. Oh, yeah, you, you don't have an education. Oh, yeah, you, you don't speak English well. Oh, yeah, you, you don't have resources. See, the enemy is a liar. The devil is a liar. And what he knows about us is that he knows our name and yet calls us by our sin. But God knows our sin and chooses to call us by our name. That is the difference between our God. There is an enemy coming up against you. You may not have the weaponry. You may not have the men. You may not have the team on your side or the education, the wherewithal, the resources. It, I don't give a rip because the God that I see in the Bible is a God who will rescue, a God who will redeem, a God who will reclaim who we are. Pick it back up in verse 18. Jael went to meet Sisera and said to him, come in, my Lord. Come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened up a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in there, just tell them no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly with him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted, and drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Now Sisera makes the fatal mistake of having Jael lie. Say, if anyone comes looking for me, just tell them uh, that I'm not here. Now, the Bible doesn't explicitly say why she killed Barak. Theologians have various explanations. I am going to throw my reason, my opinion into the ring, and I'm going to step away from God's word because this is definitely all me. But let me tell you something. Uh, uh, Jael was in her tent, in her home, in her house. Uh, recently, uh, Matt and I uh, w- moved into a new house a couple months ago, and I just, I love my house. I love my leather couches. I love my little dog, Richie. I love Parker and Ryan, my two stepkids, and my husband, and I love the people of God. So let's just get one thing straight. If I know that there is somebody who is oppressing my family, my dog, my husband, my kids, my church, God's church people, and I see 40,000 men going down this way, And I see one brother roaring back this way, comes to my house, knocks on my door, says, let me in and lie about me. I will say, okay. See, Jael is not a dumb chick. If somebody came to my house who was oppressing God's people, my family, I will straight take off my earrings. I will take off my shoes. I will straight cut you. You do not come into my house. You do not threaten God's people. You do not threaten my little doxy, Richie. No, uh-uh. You do not mess with the children of God. See, you could take the girl out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of the girl, okay? Okay. <laughs> But sometimes we need to resurrect that leadership inside of us. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what is threatening you. It doesn't matter if you have a tent peg or a pin. You've got something to defend you. You do not mess with God's people. You do not mess with God's people. Which leads me to point number three. Leaders look different. Who are the heroes of this passage? Is it Deborah, the corporate CEO, the master blaster from Lancaster? Was it Barak, the one who had led victoriously the children of Israel through multiple battles? Or was it Jael? Yes, it is all of them. 
See, well, it, it could have been Deborah, the prophetic, a judge that led the children of Israel. She was a hero. Barak was an amazing leader that led his troops to many victories. But the hand of the Canaanite army, the hand that took Sisera down, came at the hand of a stay-at-home mom. It doesn't matter what you do. If you are in the will of God, if you're doing what he's called you to do, he wants to use you. So stay in your lane. Do what God's calling you to do for this season. And it may be a season. I just change 75 diapers every day. It's a season, sister. I sit in a cubicle every day. You're putting yourself through school. Good on you. Oh, I've been on the treadmill for 45 minutes. It's okay. It's a season. It's a season. It's going to reap a harvest. Stay in your lane and do what God's called you to do. In the words of my father, it doesn't matter if you work in a warehouse or you work in the White House. God has a plan for you. And this is my life. I shared a little bit with, this, with you last time about this, but I'm not a CEO. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a social worker for A21. I'm a lover of words, which is very ironic because I grew up in the inner city. I couldn't read, write, or spell at the age of 11. I, 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 there's days where I still wrestle with, with just being the stupid, dumb, fat, brown kid from the hood. We were so poor, uh, I like to say we were so po, um, because when you're that po, you can't afford the O-R at the end of that, we just po. And you know you po when you shop at you know thrift stores and you get hand-me-downs, or you know you po when your neighbors give you their government-issued cheese. That's when you really hard up right there. And so what do you do when everything around you doesn't make sense? Well, I knew that God had a plan and a purpose and a destiny for my, of my life, for my life. And as an obese child crying out to God saying, I, I believe that you can do something with me. I see that you've done it here. It came a point in my life where I had to choose to believe the promises of God. I had to choose to believe that when God told Barack to go, that he was also telling me to go. And God may be telling you to go, to do whatever it is that he's called you to do, in whatever sphere of influence, wherever place that he has put you. And see, God didn't allow me to go to college, and God didn't allow me to go to graduate school and graduate graduate school with a 4.0 so I could be, you know, cute and use words. God doesn't give you a blessing to be selfish. God blesses you so you can be a blessing to other people. So he took the kid who couldn't read, write, or spell from the hood and gave me words because I believe that words came at the expense of freeing other people. Blessed to be a blessing. And this is what we see here. So when I heard the voice of God say, go, and it wasn't like, go. It was literally just like this voice. It sounded more like Christine Kane, my boss, um, and, and, and who's, who's kind of like the voice of God sometimes, let's be real. Um, but there are some times where I felt like God was calling me, Go, oh, go do this. Now, I knew uh, without having a formal education to fight human trafficking that I wasn't going to be dealing directly with our survivors or those on the outside who are still considered to be victims. I was going to sit behind a desk and, and use words and be there every day. And that's what I was committed to until I received an email from a coworker. We had a global gathering, and I was finishing up packing to fly to Greece where my coworker was, or where our team was gathering. And my coworker had sent me an email saying, Bianca, we have a, a victim, we believe that uh, she's a victim of human trafficking, but we can't communicate with her. She only speaks Spanish. She hasn't been able to communicate with anyone for 14 days and we do not know her story. I told her lawyer and um, the detention center that you will be translating, see you in 17 hours. To which I was like, ah, hold up. Okay, I may be brown, but the Spanish that I learned was watching novelas with my grandmother. To speak about the illegal ramifications of entry into the European Union, mur, mur, mur. like I, I'm, I'm, not your, I'm not your girl, I can't do that. So me, the woman of bold and brazen faith in a good God, sent her an email that said something like, I don't think I'm your girl. To which she emailed back and said, you're our only option. To which I emailed and said, I'm your best option. I hopped on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. I called my mom, I called my dad, I called my neighbors, dog walking covers, cousins, best friend, sisters, babysitter to be like, I need somebody pray for me. I need the gift of tongues in Spanish. I need something, somebody, I need a miracle. I was journaling prayers on the plane. I was thinking of every Spanish phrase that I could think of. I was literally praying, Jesus, you gotta show up. Literally, Jesus, take the wheel. Uh, we went to the detention center and I was escorted by our lawyer and, and a Greek guard. And we went into the detention center and I'll never forget the room. I'll never forget the scene. We walked up a narrow stairwell, mint color walls and mint color stairs. And we entered into the second story that had a thick haze of cigarette smoke. There was probably 
eight to ten guards uh, smoking cigarettes and talking with their hands as most Greeks do. I was approached by one of the guards and he asked me in English if I was the translator to which I said, see? And uh, we went over to a row of cells. These cells had concrete floors and concrete walls and concrete ceilings. And the only thing separating the free from the unfree was thick, steel impenetrable bars. I looked inside and I saw 14, 15, 16 girls laying side by side on dingy, dirty mats, covering themselves with thin green burlap blankets. And they lay there in a state of comatose, dead to everything around them, yet with a heartbeat. I looked into their eyes and I saw where they were peering and they were peering at a 12 inch television monitor screen of Dancing with the Stars. And I remember stepping back and saying, what is going on? How does this exist? God, I, I don't know why you brought me here. I don't think I'm your girl, but you've got to go. You got to, you got to, you got, you got to do something. So the guard motioned to a girl. She had caramel color skin and dark chocolate brown eyes. She was petrified. At that point, she hadn't spoken to anyone for 16 days. She stepped forward and the moment that I looked at her and I said, Hola, me llamo Bianca, nosotros queremos ayudar. Hello, my name is Bianca, we want to help you. She reached out her hand to the bars and she said, Ayúdame, ayúdame, por favor, help me, help me, please. I was so taken back. There was such a desperation in her. And yes, I was looking at her, having her beg for help. And it was one voice. But I had this moment where I realized, her voice is of 27 million people around the globe who are currently enslaved. Those 27 million people are generating $32 billion of revenue each and every year. Every 30 seconds, someone is sucked into the slave trade. The average age of entry into this free country is 11. And I'm sitting there saying, how is this going on? Galatians 5.1 says that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And I believe that that freedom should and could and will be for 27 million people across the globe. But you know what's even more important to me? That her voice reaching out through the bars of saying, ayúdame, ayúdame por favor, help me, help me please, is a voice of many people inside our churches and in our communities who may be physically free, but are slaves to sin, slaves to addiction, slaves to drugs, slaves to alcohol, slaves to work, slaves to sex, slaves to porn, slaves to their children, slaves to ambition, slaves to pride, slaves to money, that are crying out from the depths of their soul, but do not know what to do. They do not have the language to communicate, saying, ayúdame, ayúdame, por favor, help me, help me, please. I may not be David Hasselhoff, but God is raising me up to be a lifeguard for those that are drowning, for those that are overwhelmed, for those that feel like I cannot get out of this prison. And I get to, and I have to, and I want to tell you that there is a greater lifeguard, a one who went to cross the Calvary to say, I am freedom. I will rescue you. And his name is Jesus. And the person that we worship is Jesus. And the words that we speak are those of Jesus, the chief cornerstone who has given us a hope, has given us love, has given us inspiration, has given us a vision far bigger than ourselves. So you may be in pain and you may be hurting and you you may feel lost and you may feel alone but I get to tell you that there is one who is our chief cornerstone in the middle of an ocean we stand on that solid and firm foundation knowing he will not leave me he will not waver therefore I stand and worship God Almighty let us worship God let us worship God the chief cornerstone Jesus is our chief cornerstone and I want you to know that as that girl found freedom three years ago I believe that God is inviting many of us in here to find freedom. So whether you have come here for several weeks or whether you lost a bet and were dragged here by a friend or your mom or coworker brought you, I want to give you the best gift that you could ever receive and it is the gift of salvation from a man named Jesus. And you may be sitting here thinking, I have no clue what you're saying and that's okay. All you need to hear is J-E-S-U-S. -S. He is the one for us. 
If you have never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or maybe you know, I accepted Jesus like a while back, but I know that I am not walking with him. Like when Judge Ehud died, I went and go did my other thing, and God brought a Deborah into the house. Deborah's word in Hebrew, Deborah's name in Hebrew means B, and my family calls me B. So I get to be Deborah and tell you, get on your feet, dust yourself up, and get walking with Jesus. If you would like to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or if you want to rededicate your life today at any of the campuses, online, wherever you're at, God sees you. I want you to raise your hand high. Own it. God bless you. 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 God sees you. God knows why you're here. God knows why you're here. Anyone else, you're sitting here saying, I got too much pride. God knows what you've done and God don't care. He's saying, raise your hand because when you confess me among men, I will confess you amongst my father. Will you please raise your hand? Thank you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you and you and you. God bless you, God sees you, God bless you. God bless you at all of our campuses. If you are around somebody who's, who's raised their hand or even here, will you just touch their back and say, we stand with you and we pray as a congregation. Dear Jesus, thank you for your son. Forgive me of my sin, cleanse my heart. Talk back to me, church, we're praying to Jesus. Come on, we gotta pray. We're going to start that again because I even messed it up. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Wash my heart anew. Cleanse my mind. Fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Write my name in the book of life. I choose you. Thank you for choosing me. The name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Can we thank Bianca at every one of our locations for the words she brought today? I tell you, I'm so thankful that um, we get to partner with A21 and see girls like we're in that prison in Greece, freed from human trafficking and sex trafficking. Um, I had planned this, and um, I know we have the resources um, because you're a giving church, but we're going to send a check this week for $25,000 to A21 to continue to invest in what God is doing there. So, and we don't, we don't have to take up a special offering. It's just because you're a generous church, and the way that we budget so that we can give when God pros those opportunities and um, so we're just thankful for your generosity you've already given you'll give today and um, but there's no special offering needed it's because you're generous and so I couldn't be more grateful for that but you're literally literally saving lives literally every day somewhere around the world and not just around the world I don't want you to think that human trafficking is around the world thing it's an American issue it's an American issue so your generosity is making a difference in the lives of so many people. Thank you again. We love you guys. Your family. Your family. Once again, we want to thank you for visiting LifePoint Church online. We pray that the message today has inspired you to know Jesus in a deeper way. We also hope that you will visit one of our locations in person. While it's our goal to produce an excellent online experience for you, nothing quite compares to visiting LifePoint Church in person. For times and directions, click on the Locations tab on the top of the page. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you right here next week at LifePoint Church Online.